I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and I am thrilled that you're here this week. We have someone that I've wanted to have on this show for so long. I can't believe I haven't met him before because it just feels like at some point we would have done it. But we have Matt Vogel. You know him, Kermit the Frog, the Muppets, Big Bird. We can go on and on and on, and we will. Matt, how are you? I'm great, Carrie. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I like I just said, I feel like we should have met at some point. I know. Yeah, I I, uh, I can't believe that we haven't. But uh, but you know what? Here we are, and uh, and this is great. So let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. And so yeah. many places I want to go. Um, so let's just start from the beginning, I guess. How did you get into puppeteering and all of the things that you do? Sure. Well, I grew up during the 70s where uh you know the first generation sesame street watcher and muppet show watcher and i was so i was fascinated i loved uh, in particular the muppet show i also loved sesame street the characters just popped out out of the out of the screen for me you know and uh and i just i just loved it i i built my own puppets uh out of out of t-shirts that, that i took from my dad's uh drawer and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was probably seven or eight. And I just used masking tape and, and I just cobbled together these uh, very rough puppets. But uh, I just, I was compelled to do it. I was inspired to do it. And uh, I would entertain the kids in the neighborhood. I would, uh, you know, go around, my, make my brother get behind the sofa and we'd do shows for uh, our family or, uh, what else would we do? My dad built us a stage. He built a, a stage out of uh, some plywood and and uh, paneling, actually. And uh, it, we would do shows for church and uh, for the PTA in our town. And I, but that was as I didn't know that it was something that you could actually do for a living. I never thought of it that way at all. I was just in awe of these people that I knew probably very little about, you know, Jim Henson and Frank Oz and, and Jerry Nelson and Dave Goals and Richard Hunt and Carol Spinney and, I, I, and Fran Brill. I knew very little about them growing up, but I was uh, introduced to a book called Of Muppets and Men. And in that book, it was a making of the Muppet Show, Carrie. I don't know if you know this book, but it's this great book. It's a great book. And in it, they you know, they kind of show you everything. They show you how right. the Muppet Show was made. And you can see the pictures of the puppeteers with their arms in the air. And, you know, I was fascinated by that and fascinated by every time I would watch Sesame Street or the Muppet Show. And every once in a while, you might see like a little head right in the corner or, uh, you know, the, the sub sleeve where the live hand goes in and you see the sub sleeve part of the, uh, of the puppet. And I knew there was more going on down below that frame. And I was fascinated by it, but never knew that it would be something that I could do for a living. Now, were you also doing the voices? Were you making up your own voices? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I wrote shows. Uh, they were usually kind of uh, <laughs> loose plagiarizations of like other shows, like Charlie Brown. Like we had like a kind of a... a, a what was it? It was like a great pumpkin type. Uh, I'm just remembering this just now, so it's a little fuzzy, but I, <laughs> I, we did some sort of like great pumpkin show, a Halloween show. And, uh, you know, we would do the voices. Uh, my dad had acquired uh, a sound system, a, a very ancient, probably from the, the maybe early 60s uh, sound system that the, we would wear these microphones around our neck and kind of kind of lav mics but they were they were sure. like this big they were big and chunky and my brother and i who were you know small we'd put these right. the mics <laughs> just felt giant around our right. necks and that's how we would you know project our voice 
uh, but it was it was a it was a fun time for me. I had a great time. I don't know how much fun my brother had, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you ever talked about that? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, he just kind of he uh, reluctantly but willingly went along. He did, he he did it, and he's a great guy. Uh, he's one of my biggest supporters. So I love that. I love that. So when do you start realizing that you could make make money doing this and and there's a fine line with that because I have a feeling you feel like I do about it, that it's it's way more than that. Being able to entertain and do what you love and all those things, it's way more than money. When did you start realizing that this yeah. was something that was possible? Well, it was in college, I think. Uh, and uh, a friend of mine, my roommate, uh, Chad Harris, had been doing something over the summer. He was going to do something over the summer, a, a water safety show with puppets. And he knew that I had puppets. So I brought along some puppets and we kind of did this show together over the summer and I got paid for it. And uh, that was kind of where I realized that I could make money at it. But still, again, it was very, uh, the dreams were very near. They weren't, they weren't far away. Uh, they were right where I was. You know, I was in St. Louis. That's where I went to college. And uh, later, after college, I moved uh, back home to Kansas City for a year to make money. I went to college to be an actor. So my ultimate goal at that moment was to go to New York City to become an actor. And uh, in Do the meantime, on, I went- on screen stuff? Yeah, stage, yeah. screen, whatever. Okay. I was trained as a, as a theater actor. And, uh, and so I went back to Kansas City to make some money to move to New York. And in doing so, I created a, a show called uh, the uh, Puppy Joe Traveling Show. And it was this little puppy puppet that I had made. And we, I scheduled a, like a series of four, I think it was four or five shows throughout the summer. And, and I just kind of cold called up preschools and uh, daycare centers and I, all throughout the Kansas City area. And this time I didn't hire, I didn't hire my brother to do this. <laughs> I hired a friend of mine named Brian Stubler, who was a good friend of mine uh, back in Kansas City. And we, uh, we went around Kansas City doing these puppet shows and, and uh, I made money that way to earn enough money to go to New York City. It's interesting. I was thinking about this as you're saying all this, you know, what we have today, obviously, with YouTubes and podcasts, and there's so much information out there. Yeah. And people that are willing to help people. But back yeah. then, I mean, you just really figured it out. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, I'd had no idea. I, I knew, like I say, I, I knew about uh, the, the Muppet style of puppetry, which is using a television monitor, but using a TV to watch, it, to watch your performance. Uh, but there weren't YouTube videos that I could look at or any other resources right. like that. I actually, when I was a senior in college, uh, our, our, uh, our class traveled to New York to do a showcase, an acting showcase. And, uh, and I also decided at that time, uh, why not? I'm going to make a video, a puppet video. So I made a puppet video uh, trying to use the monitor. I sent it to, to New York, to the Jim Henson company. And uh, they sent me a very nice rejection letter uh, <laughs> that I still have. And, um, and it was ultimately the person that sent me the rejection letter. Her name is Renee Rochelle. She was the talent coordinator at the time. And eventually when I moved back, when I moved to New York, she kind of took me under her wing and, uh, you know, uh, guided me through some of my early days at, uh, at Muppets. It's fascinating. Yeah. So what, what, cause we've all had, the, we've all had no. So you get the letter, but that obviously didn't stop you. Yeah. Did it, did it make you want to train more? Did it make you go, I need to get to them? Kind of what did that you know, fire? I, did it, I, it light under you? I wasn't, I guess I wasn't that phased by it because my <laughs> goal at that time was to go to New York to be an actor anyway. It wasn't to be a, a Muppet performer. I'm, I'm still was thinking, you know, there are already people that do that. You know, right. there are people that do that. I'm not going to be one of those people. I'm going to go and be an actor. And, uh, you know, I, I had, so it didn't phase me. I, I had an experience though, when I was a, a freshman in uh, middle school, uh, it was called junior high then. I, <laughs> I was yeah. in junior high. I was a ninth grader. And we were in, uh, we had a, a talent show. And at this talent show, again, I had written a show. 
and performed this show with my friend Brian Stubler, and we we won the talent show. And I remember hearing as they were as they said my name and as we went up there, uh, I remember hearing boos. I remember hearing you know it wasn't like I wasn't inundated with it, but I could hear right. a few people. And that really shook me. That did shake me enough that I put the puppets away and I did not take them out for, I didn't do them at school anymore. I, uh, I turned to acting then after that. Uh, but, but that was something that could have really, I mean, it did affect me at the time, but not something that kind of stuck for too long. You yeah, I, I think, yeah, and I think that's important because, you know, obviously I was told no many times. <laughs> I just yeah. just kept going and it, it can definitely be something that, you know, that gets your attention and you have to work through. Yeah, I agree. So you get to New York. When mm -hmm. when do we get to the Muppet story and the and Sesame well, Street story? No, not, not long after, actually, before I had moved to New York, I, uh, we went up to get an apartment and, uh, my, my girl, then girlfriend, now wife, Kelly, we had, uh, moved, we went to New York to get an apartment. We found an apartment, but we couldn't get in for a month. So we were going to go back to Ohio to stay with Kelly's mom. And while we were on our way back to Ohio, Kelly saw in the acting, uh, backstage newspaper, she saw an ad and this ad had a picture of Kermit the frog. And it said, do you measure up to be a Muppet? And it said that we're looking for somebody that's, uh, you know, my size, my height, left-handed, and here's a here's a, a an address to write to, and maybe a phone number. And I mean, it was me. It was describing me in this <laughs> ad. I am left-handed. I'm a right-handed puppeteer, but I am left-handed. So I answered this ad. I I I either wrote a letter, which I feel like I wrote a letter, um, and probably called. I probably did both <laughs> because I was like, oh, why not? Let's just take a shot at it. And uh, I soon her got a call back uh, saying, well, um, we're going to wait. Uh, let us know when you're in, in New York. And I was like, oh, that's weird, but okay. But I guess, <laughs> you know, maybe it was scheduling. I'm sure it was, you know, a lot sure. of different people scheduling and there's some time, you know, maybe they weren't necessarily waiting for me. So we moved to New York and it was uh, at the end of the year, it was, uh, it was uh, in November, I think, November, early December that I uh, had an audition for the Jim Henson company. And it was with John Henson, Jim's youngest son, uh, who's now passed on. And um, he was doing a Coca-Cola polar bear puppet that they had created yeah. a full body character. So you know what this is like. I do, <laughs> full body. I do. It was, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a prototype actually. And John was going around and doing uh, Coca-Cola polar bear appearances at Coke events. And I mean, he did the Olympics. He did a bunch of other, he skied. He was skiing in this big Coca-Cola polar bear at the Olympics. Uh, and uh, he wanted somebody that could step in for him if he was not available, he was very busy. And so uh, I had the audition with him. That's where I met, I said, Renee Rochelle a little while back. That's where I met her for real this time. And, uh, and John, um, I was the last guy to audition. And John asked me if I wanted to go to lunch that day. And I was like, yes, I absolutely want to go to lunch <laughs> with you, John Henson. Uh, we right. had lunch. Yeah, we had lunch. And, and um, I, I probably told him everything that I've told you up to now. And, uh, and then he said, yeah, you, you want to come to my house for New Year's Eve? I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Kelly and I went up to his place. Uh, it, it was this old school house on New Year's Eve. He had renovated this old schoolhouse, and it was amazing. It was just this really cool experience to go from, you know, just moving to New York and, you know, days, right. weeks later, having this audition for this company that I, uh, you know, have been so inspired by as a kid. Again, never really thinking this is what I'm going to do because every, right. you know, I could do this. I was still thinking I was going to be an actor. Uh, and, um, <laughs> you know, it, he then, I started doing this Coca-Cola polar bear with when John was not available. And uh, the reason why they needed a left-handed performer is because, uh, because they wanted him to be able to shake hands with, with people. So the hand went up inside the head, my left hand okay. to, to move the mouth and blink the eyes or make him grin. I think he had a grin. And then the right hand could, could shake people's hands. And, and there was a, a camera in the nose 
in the nose of the Coca-Cola polar bear, if I remember correctly. It was either the nose of the, I think it was the nose. And, and I wore a monitor so that I could see where I was going. Uh, and so that was my first real experience with a professional puppet. Uh, a walk, first time I had done a walk around, for yeah, sure. So I, was, I was wondering if you'd been in a body puppet no. before that. <laughs> no, no, it was the first time I had ever been inside a full body puppet. And, uh, you know, it was fun. It was, it was exhausting. It was very, you know, hard, you know, it was hard work. It's your whole body right. is, is working in there. And uh, that's, that was kind of how I got in to the Muppets. I'd gotten my foot in that way, thanks to John Henson. Well, and just hanging out with John Henson. I mean, that, obviously everyone knows the name. I mean, that's yeah. gotta be an unbelievable experience. What, I, I'm curious, so you're in a body puppet. What are you thinking? Because it's, you know, it's my hot. first time, right, it, it's, it's hot. And, it's and not very for, comfortable. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not claustrophobic. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Cause th you know? that's a big part, obviously. And then yeah. you kind of go, so this is where my career, I like, you probably <laughs> never saw it going there, but it's nope. such a cool thing to be doing. Yeah. It was really cool. I mean, we, uh, I, I remember like in particular, there was a, an appearance I must've done it. Like the, it must've been in Atlanta. I'm sure it was at a big Coke corporate event, a big Coca-Cola corporate event. And I remember, uh, you know, doing whatever appearances I had to do. And then there was a concert that night and the B-52s were there. And <laughs> I was so excited. It was just really cool to kind of be like, wow. And I was very close to them, watching them, uh, you know, and it was just wild to suddenly, you know, go from this kid in the Midwest to now being, uh, you know, going to Atlanta and doing this thing for the Jim Henson company and what, getting to see the B-52s right in front right. of me. And, you know, it was, it was wild. It was crazy. I still didn't think that this was my career though. I still did not think that this was the thing I was going to be doing. I still felt outside. I still felt pretty outside the, the group, you know? So. How long did you do that for? Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't that long, really. I, maybe a year, maybe a little more than a year. Um, because again, Renee Rochelle called and said, um, can you do a big bird voice? And I said, oh yes, of course. I never <laughs> thought about that, but you're supposed to say yes. So I said, yes, I, of course I have done a big bird voice. And she said, well, you know, um, there, Carol is looking for somebody to to step in to step in for him when he again when he's unavailable. Right. <laughs> he he liked to take vacations and and uh, he enjoyed his life a lot. And um, there were things that that he didn't really necessarily want to do anymore. He was sixty five at the time, and so that's you know that's the that's kind of retiring age. But Carol right. had no no <laughs> intention of retiring. Uh, and, uh, he just wanted somebody to be there for him just in case. So that audition, I had never met Carol and Renee introduced me to him at the time and said, you know, Carol, this is Matt Vogel, Matt Vogel, Carol Spinney and Carol's eyes lit up and he said, Oh, Vogel, your name means bird. This, this may be the job for you. Uh, so I kind of lucked out that, that Carol knew German Yes, yes. and, uh, I did the audition and there were other people there that I'm now very good friends with other wow. people at this audition, you know, but I didn't know them at the time. Uh, again, I kind of felt like this outsider and, uh, and Carol was wonderful and, uh, he, uh, he picked me and, uh, we had a couple of other sessions, just, just the two of us inside Big Bird which is a, 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 yeah. whole, a whole other different kind of uh, full body puppet. And, uh, and to do uh, someone else's character in front of them is, <laughs> is not the most comfortable thing to do. You know, right. it's, it feels a little awkward because you're trying to, you know, impress them, of course. Right. Uh, but it's just, a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. But Carol was always so supportive of me and always so kind and generous. Uh, he really, he treated me like a son, both he and his wife, Debbie, treated me like a son. And um, I, I love them for that. And I, I want to talk about that before. I, I'm curious, 
because I've been in that experience as well of, can you do this? Well, sure I can. And then I got to go figure I didn't know how to dance. They asked me if I could dance. I had to go learn how to, right. to dance. So I totally get that. Yeah. So what did you do? Okay. So you get off the phone and now you got to start working on the big yeah. bird voice. Yeah. I thought, I mean, I, of course I knew big bird and I could sure. hear him in my head. Uh, but, and I'm not like the big, I'm not the, I will be the first to admit that I'm not the, I'm not a spot on uh, impersonator or mimicker of someone's voice. I can get the intonation and I can get the musicality, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not like a straight uh, voice match, which that's just, that's just not what I do. Uh, I do my best at it. And so what I did is I went out and I got a CD of uh, Big Bird's greatest hits. I think it was called The Bird is the Word. And I just listened to that over and over and it was just Big Bird singing. And um, in my head, I hear that Big Bird that I heard when I was a kid. So it was a lot higher uh, uh, pitched than, than probably where Carol was at that time, mm -hmm. um, just because of, of how our voices age. And, uh, but that was what I clued into. I just, I went out and got this CD and I just listened to it relentlessly. And, uh, and you know, again, there was no YouTube, so I couldn't go and just watch endless right. clips at this, right. at this time. So uh, that's how I did it. That's what I did. And, and uh, thankfully he, Carol thought I was good enough to, you know, work with. And what is that like? What is that like when Carol Spinney says, <laughs> that's good enough? I mean, you know, that worked, that's yeah. it. Uh, you know, it's, that's kind of when I started to think, oh, this is like a bigger deal than what I was kind of thinking all of this was. Uh, and I had been doing, I, I had been doing a little bit of monitor work on my own. Mm -hmm. I had done a new puppet video that, uh, that I had sent to Renee and she was like, you're good. Okay, well, we're going to get you into these workshops. Uh, these puppet workshops and um, and just being able to realize that this was bigger than what I thought it was and try to go with it is <laughs> it's, it's a little daunting, but at first, but uh, but Carol was always so supportive and always just like I said, so kind. And you know, he would give me little pointers, or he would he, he was he was he was very kind of hands off really he would trust he trusted me very early on i feel like and and i and he's he said that to me and and his wife debbie also had said that he just he trusts you and uh so that's a big responsibility to to take that trust this carol had created this character right many many years before and was entrusting me with keeping that uh, keeping it alive if he was unable to do so at some at any point uh so it was a big responsibility but of course you can't think about that right when you're doing it you got to think about uh, fall back on acting training and think about the character and what how this character is pure what what this character means and yeah you know it's yeah it's all mind-blowing i i got the chance to work with him and and i, I met debbie and i I had talked about it on this show a lot of times because I've never seen anything like it. He was the absolute kindest person in the world. His skill level level was one of the most amazing things I had I had ever seen. I, I've told it on this show, but the the short of it is we were doing a, a remote. So Barney and Big Bird were showing up in you know Good Morning Pittsburgh, Good Morning Dallas, Good Morning New York, and at one point he starts doing Oscar's voice. <laughs> from Big Bird. Big Bird is having a conversation with Oscar that of course is not there and didn't tell me any of that things that's gonna happen. And so now I am having a conversation <laughs> with Oscar <laughs> and him and he just did it off the, off the fly. Yeah, Carol was very in the moment. Like uh, he would, he would, uh, he was just a, I thought he was a great actor. He was very in the moment. He would, his line readings were often they're different from take to take, which means it's really alive and still popping, and you know it's it's there's right. some real, some real uh, heart to it, uh, is what I always felt, and uh, so I I'm not at all surprised that he would suddenly you know just start <laughs> talking as uh, Oscar and and Big Bird is also there, yeah, yeah, and and the other thing I always remember is how, as you you understand, and I 
everyone wanted to talk to him. Everyone wanted to hear his stories, everything. And so I had a dresser there and, and uh, you know, we do these separate, Bar Barney is a two actor situation. And so um, Bob West was there. And so everyone wants to ask Carol all these questions. And at one point Carol goes, I is Carrie okay? Does, does Carrie need, the, the one that was more concerned about me than anyone, because I couldn't yeah. get in and out, takes it's a longer process. Oh my gosh, yeah. But he wanted to make sure I had water and towels and all that. And of course, everyone else takes amazing care of me. But he was able to answer all their questions and concerned himself about me. And I just, you know, you, mm. you're so excited to get to meet someone and he's bigger and better. And I could have never yeah. imagined. Yeah, How that's very Carol to me. Hearing that is it's a very Carol kind of thing, you know, to make sure that you were okay. So for you, when do you, because you've got two things going on, right? You're, you're trying to learn the character. Mm -hmm. When do you start realizing how big this is and the importance for kids and everyone knows the voice and everyone knows Big Bird? And I mean, we're not talking about the U.S. We're talking about everyone around the world knows this, this character. When do you start letting that in a little bit to yourself? Well, you know, to me, uh, even still, even still, uh, this this is a character that I'm taking care of for Carol, right. uh, uh, even though Carol's not here to to do that right now. Um, so it it almost feels like the it's kind of off of me. <laughs> it's it's I'm only in that I'm taking care of it for Carol. You know, right. of course, it's a big responsibility. And, and I don't know that I ever didn't feel that it was a big deal. But I also was very mindful and, and continue to be that the person that came before me um, created this character. And I it's my job, my duty to try to continue the legacy of that character, the heart of that character, for as long as I am allowed to do that with whatever character characters that I play you know so so um I, I don't know exactly when it would have hit me that, how big it was I guess I always knew that you know being a part of Sesame Street was a big deal right um I, and it just kind of it just very organically happened I don't even you know I, I had a job at a at a pet food store while I worked at New York uh, while I was in New York I uh I had a job as a an assistant to a dean of business at Fordham University. Um, I was also trying to do acting jobs, and once I couldn't do those things anymore because Sesame Street responsibilities at Sesame Street were uh, too many, uh, that's when I knew. Oh wait, I'm, this is what I'm doing now. This is my job. This is the thing that I'm going to do. Why, I'm one of the guys that gets to do this. <laughs> then it becomes real and uh, insane. It's insane. What's his, uh, what's it like the first time Big Bird, as you get to interact with people, when you're actually not just doing it for a show or something, but you're actually out in the public? We, there's a couple different scenarios that I can think of off the top of my head. We used to do this uh, Christmas tree lighting at Lincoln Center, right across the street from where the Sesame Workshop corporate offices are. And we would put together this show. And that was maybe the first time that I, inside Big Bird, because Carol was, uh, I think he, he usually would, uh, at the end of the season in December, he and Debbie would go off, uh, they would go to Ireland for Christmas and they would kind of have an extended time there. So he was not available to do these uh, these Christmas tree lighting. So I was gonna do them and it was a live appearance, which is kind of a good practice for somebody that's trying to do this. And coming out like from the tent, you know, that first time and hearing this crowd of people recognize Big Bird is uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, this, uh, it's, I can't explain it. It's like a feeling, it's a feeling of, of joy, like just of, of happiness and, and, and love and pure joy, which, uh, because that's what that character inspires in people and, and brings out of people. And I was feeling that love inside the puppet, you know? Um, so there's that, and that, that's nice. And, and that makes you feel really, really good. And then there have been times, uh, when I have, 
had the honor of of doing um, um, visiting a child, a sick child, mm -hmm. and uh, and their families, and uh, and the impact of that, the the impact that Big Bird has on that family, and the and their their uh, understanding that this moment is important to Big Bird to be there with their child uh, is 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 moving in a whole other way uh, and just as important and, and maybe if not more important uh, to have that kind of effect uh, on a child like directly with them and their family so those are those are the really kind of the best those live moments are really special and also those really personal moments when you are with somebody and they uh, and their family uh, those are also really special moments you know yeah i i, I was couldn't wait to get to that subject because I had I did thousands over the over the years and make a wishes and those things. I was 23 when I started the role of Barney uh, when I was started playing Barney and I, I was looking for a job. You know, I was kind of what you're talking about doing, and all of a sudden you re you understand there's a whole different thing going on here, and you understand there's a responsibility that when you're that character, it's all the things you're saying. It's I'm smiling inside and out talking to you because <laughs> I, I, I learned all those things that, you know, I didn't know when they, they took me to a hospital, I had no idea what I was in for yeah. and how those kids are the most amazing I've ever seen and how they, that I mean, you were so real to them and they have these conversations with you and there's just another level. So yeah, obviously I know the costume's hot and I know all of those things, but all of a sudden that all goes away and you're just <laughs> yeah, does. in this and, and you see some of the most incredible things, you know, I've gone into burn units and had kids sing the I love you song, which you're like, how is that possible? <laughs> and they're telling you they love you and all of that. And you're, yeah. you know, you're, you're, it's just, it's incredible. Um, what was like for you going even a little deeper into this when you go in the first time and you really see how important Big Bird is to these kids and to the, glad you said that, and to the families. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, we've, similarly, we've had lots of children come to the set of Sesame Street to visit. And, uh, and it's just, it's, it's, a moment when you're, when I feel like I'm really connected with humanity, you know, I'm, I'm really connected with, with, uh, with what it means, with what it means to be these characters and how important they are, because you're right. The children and a lot of times adults too <laughs> see these characters as, as real because they are, they, they right. exist in the real world. They go out and you see them here and there, uh, and um, they're real. They can hug you. They can they can actually touch you and make contact with you, and they are real. And when it's when someone brings their child in, and you have that moment to interact with the child, and then the parents, and then you know the family, etc. There is it's like I said, it's this feeling of it's the essence of what humanity should be. Yeah, it, it's it's such an amazing thing, this experience. And and what was it like for you when you go in to this hospital and you see how important Big Bird is, these kids, and obviously to their parents and, and siblings? Oops. Did you not hear me? Did we? Yeah, I didn't hear you there. You kind of went oh. away and then you froze for some. I don't know what's going on here. Literally. It's telling me. Let me see something here real quick. Because I can take care of this. <clears throat> I apologize about this, sorry. Can you hear me? Can you not hear me? Can you not hear me? 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm trying to turn everything else off, so <laughs> I, I don't know what was going on, but I apologize. Okay. Of course, I've never had this problem until. <laughs> I, might... I know it always happens. It's weeks and weeks of clear, perfect Wi-Fi, and then right. I've done <laughs> ton, need it. <laughs> a ton of these, and this happened. All right, I'll ask that question again. Okay. So, what was it like for you when you go in and and you realize, you know, how important this is to the kids, the the siblings, and the parents? Uh, this is a very it's a very good question. You know, I, what I feel about it is I feel like it's that moment of pure humanity where, where both sides of this, this family and, and Sesame street or, or whoever it might be, they're coming together for this very pure moment of humanity, of love, of kindness, of all the things that, you know, Sesame street stands for. Uh, but it should be the thing that everybody in the world stands for. It's this really pure moment of humanity. It is, it is one of the more difficult things to do because it is emotionally difficult in that little moment that we are there. But um, for a family that's going through a, a tremendous amount of, of grief or heartache or difficulty, it is, there's probably nothing better for them in that moment. And, and I love those moments of humanity. I really well, do. It, didn't, it, it changed my whole perspective on, on everything, on, on life, on humanity, as you, as you see, because you really see that we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of laugh and I understand the whole point that people will say, you know, what you did for those kids. I'm like, what those kids did for me is more than I could have ever have done for those kids without question. Um, I agree. It changed my yeah, life. It's very reciprocal. It's very reciprocal. Yeah, you're, you're, you're getting just, you know, just as much, if not more than what you're giving them seeing things, I mean, you see how fearless they are and you're seeing things that and I went into one a, a little girl hadn't spoken in two years mm. and I didn't know this. And so we're having a, you know, I'm playing and we're doing all this stuff and everyone's crying and you don't find out till later what just happened. And, mm. I, and I think, you know, we talk about how, especially with, and this is why I love this interview is that with Big Bird and with Barney, what you see on TV is what they are. There's no different. They are they are as real as they can be. I know you know Bear and the Big Blue. A lot of those characters do so well because what the kids see on TV. Now they're probably and you probably get this. They're a lot bigger than they, <laughs> than they expect. Like oh, Big yeah. Bird comes in a room. Yeah, yeah. You can all you can have a couple different reactions to Big Bird entering a room. Uh, thankfully, usually it's the one where people are happy and smiling and it's, and it's great, but I have had times, uh, where you enter a room and a child is just not ready for it. <laughs> well, usually on set on Sesame street and you'll enter the room or they'll put the puppet on me and, uh, it's just too much. Then they can't handle it because they're looking at it on a box or on their little device or whatever it is. He seems relatively small, but he is a very big bird. He's aptly named. <laughs> yes, yes. You know? Well, I'm doing this interview and I'm sitting in my head the whole time going, I was just going to ask about Kermit. You got to talk about Kermit. So oh, I got to sure. talk about, I got to talk about Kermit. Yeah. When did that happen? That was in 2017. Okay. And, uh, and um, I had been part of the core Muppet performers for the, what I call the Disney Muppets. Okay. just to differentiate them from the Sesame Street Muppets. Okay. Uh, I've been a part of, of those Muppets since uh, 2008, when I took uh, on the roles uh, that were originally performed by Jerry Nelson, who was a great Muppet performer and a, and a good friend of mine. And I, I had the pleasure of right-handing for him, assisting him, helping him out for many years on Sesame Street as uh, his right hand for the count. Jerry played the count along with many, many other fantastic roles for the, the Disney Muppets. And so in 2008, uh, he decided, or 2007, he decided he did not want to travel anymore. And so I then was not given those roles, but we, we talked about those roles and, and I took those roles on. And then uh, in 2017, 
uh, uh, Steve Whitmire uh, left the Muppets and there was a need to fill that role. And um, it was a, a process, a very difficult process, a long process, not only difficult because Steve was no longer there, but uh, difficult just in trying to figure this out, what to do, what steps to go next. And Disney really wanted Kermit to um, have the essence of, of uh, Jim's Kermit. And, um, and that is kind of what I now try to do. That was the Kermit that I grew up with. Um, although I, I worked a lot with Steve and I worked with his Kermit for years and years and years. And, um, but that was the, kind of the way that they wanted to go uh, for it. And so that was what our, our uh, instructions were. Uh, and in 2017, I got a call and they said, you're, you're Kermit, which uh, is as daunting, if not more daunting than being told you're Big Bird. It's a, it's a, big, uh, it's a big thing. Those are big flippers to fill. It's a really, it's a really big thing. And <laughs> I, you know, I've told a few family members that you were going to be on and uh, all I get is Kermit. They all <laughs> I'm like, ah, Kermit, 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 Kermit. <laughs> now, obviously, Kermit and Big Bird do have a, their, their, their person, their demeanors. There's a little bit there that's the same in that, that aspect of it. Um, what is it like for you? Well, obviously the voice, we want to talk about the voice. Um, now Kermit can got a, maybe a little wide, wider range. Yeah. Um, you know, I think how I would look at it is Big Bird is, is an innocent you know, and not that Kermit isn't. The Muppets in general are innocents. They are innocents, right. all of them. Uh, Big Bird just happens to be a six-year-old uh, innocent and Kermit is, you know, however old he is, however old right. it is in frog years. I don't know how right. it is, but he is that age uh, in frog years. He's a little bit more wise to the world. Uh, he's a little, he can be a little bit more uh, uh, snarky. He can be a little bit more playful. Um, he can get doggone mad, like downright mad at somebody. And uh, you know, the, both characters I feel like are three-dimensional characters. They have they have uh, they're fully rounded characters, and they're both really fun to play. Uh, and uh, but yeah, I didn't. I they are I guess similar in that they are innocents. They are all of them are innocents. Um, what's it like working on his to get his voice? Do you have confidence so, now because you've done Big Bird? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a certain confidence that comes with having done this for many, many, many years. And then I took over for the count. Uh, and then I took over for all those roles that Jerry did. So I've had a lot of performance under my belt. Uh, it's nothing quite as not quite the same as taking on Kermit, I think. Uh, for me, vocally, I would, uh, I mean, for months and months and months, I would just listen to Jim Henson. If I could hear interviews of Jim, I would listen to interviews of Jim. If I would listen, to, I would listen to Kermit being interviewed, or I would li listen to different uh, iterations of songs that, that Jim had recorded as Kermit or uh, Kermit uh, performances. I would listen to those. I wanted to try to get uh, kind of both sides of it, Jim's side of it and the Kermit side of it. And uh, we had the great fortune of working with Brian Henson, uh, and he he had us there and workshopped with us, and he would point us in a certain direction. He would he called it having this ooey gooey uh, feeling in the voice, this ooey gooeyness that that uh, he, that's how he heard Kermit, and he heard his dad, and so that's what. <clears throat> now, you know, I tried to put that in it. But for me, I've, I've been doing it for three years now. And again, like I said before, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, a, a voice match, but I feel that my acting ability and my heart and intention are in the right place. And, um, you know, the vocal quality, you know, I'm working on just like I work on with Big Bird, just like I work on with The Count. I work on all of those vocal qualities and I'll still go back and listen to the original performer. I'll still go and listen to Carol. I'll go and listen to Jerry. Uh, I'll listen to Richard Hunt as another character, a person that a performer that I've taken a character on from. And of course, Jim. 
And all of those things, just kind of having those things at my fingertips now is great. It's a great help to me to be able to have those to help me work on vocal qualities. And, uh, and then I've also got Dave Goals, who is a veteran Muppet performer uh, for over 40 years, who is there, who is, you know, kind of guiding us all not just me, but the whole group of Muppet performers. He's kind of guiding us all and and uh, giving us pointers and tips and hints and uh, and uh, and so I'm I'm very lucky in that in that respect to have so much support from all the Muppet performers and uh, and from the fans too. Well, and that's interesting because so my sister is the absolute biggest fan of the Count. So <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, I I, I always loved that because I, I grew up watching Sesame Street as well. Yeah. But I really got to know the count because my sister just couldn't get enough of that. <laughs> what is that like for you? Because you you've got to have fans like that that know the count or know Big Bird or know you know these different characters you're playing. Yeah, it's it's amazing, you know, and <laughs> and uh, it's it's great to to be able to embody these characters and keep them alive for those performers that came before me, and. And then also to recognize how they do affect people, how how they do love these characters. Uh, so it's I'm I'm just very grateful. I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given, for sure. Well, and it's interesting. Sesame Street, obviously, uh, for the most part, it's a younger demographic. But but the Muppets, yeah, you know who doesn't love the Muppets? So <laughs> so that you're you're dealing with two different audiences there. You're definitely dealing with a lot of adults. When it comes to yeah. the Muppets. Yeah, and, and I feel like with the Muppets more so than Sesame Street, because you're right, Sesame Street is for, is really predominantly for, right now, it is predominantly for like the under two age group. Right. Uh, although we do have, we do skew a little bit higher on certain on certain parts of the show. And, uh, but the Muppets has always been for everybody, for the little guys all the way up to, you know, grandparents and beyond. And that's when it's really exciting. When we can, when we can try to get everybody and let everybody enjoy something, that is that is the that's the sweet spot for the Muppets. Uh, yeah, it. So, I've got so much stuff going on here in my head. <laughs> You've got so much going on in my head here. I I, I want to get back to what's the difference for you because I was only a body actor. So what is the difference between being a puppeteer and then doing a body acting? What challenges do you see with both of those? They're very similar, I would say, overall. The, 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 the biggest difference to me is when I am at Sesame Street and I am playing the count, for example, I'm sitting on a rolling, like a rolling seat that sits on the floor got my arms up in the air and next to me is Carmen Ospar and she's got Rosita up in the air and, and next to me over here is Ryan Dillon and he's got Elmo on and uh, you know somebody's assisting me I've got you know Jen Barnhart is assisting me and uh, Pam Marciero is assisting Carmen and we're all right there and we can kind of see each other and we're all uh, able to kind of we kind of coexist as this as one unit uh, when I am inside Big Bird, all of that is gone. It's it's really isolating. I'm sure this is familiar to you, yes. Carrie. <laughs> it is very it, familiar it's, to me. It, it, it's isolating, you know. I, I, even though I can feel them, I know that they're there, and I can see them on my monitor. I can see that they're there. I don't have that part, that feeling of of togetherness that I did when I was sitting on the floor, when I'm inside the big, when I'm inside Big Bird. I just, it just, you can't can't do it. It doesn't work the same, uh, and that's really the biggest part of it. And it's not a bad thing. It's um, it's that's just the that's the biggest difference to me. The heat or any of that stuff doesn't matter to me. The the weight of the puppet that that's a thing that <laughs> that kind of matters to me a bit right but, um and being isolated doesn't really affect me now um and and i don't know that it really did too much you know but those are the biggest differences that i can see but didn't it for so for me it just really made me focus i mean you really 
because you're there. Yeah. So you're really focusing. And obviously, whether it's a purple dinosaur or a big yellow bird, everyone's watching you. I mean, wherever you are, yeah. whatever you're doing, everyone's watching you. Yeah. And so I think there's that pressure to, to stay in character, obviously. But also just everything. I don't know. I was just so focused. Yeah, I, I agree. Inside the puppet, it's a lot easier to stay focused. When you're down, you're down on the floor and, you know, people are talking and they're pointing at lines sure. or they're saying like, I might see this or, you know, people are chatting about what they did for lunch or, you know, it's, right. it's a little That's harder right. for me to be a part of that conversation. So it, it is a lot easier for me to stay, to be focused and to kind of just hone in on what it is that I'm trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we used to joke because, you know, obviously we had, the, we talked about earlier, the voice actors, They'd be in my ear talking about lunch and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and it's a completely different thing because, yeah. you know, they're in booths and all that. It's kind of what you're talking about with the puppeteers. And then yeah. with us, you know, when you've got the weight and the heat and, 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 you know, you're performing with kids, which may not get their, their take right. You know, you have to be right every time. Yeah. You do kind of have to be on the ball as much as you can. And, Right. You know, another, uh, what was it I was going to say when you said something there, it made me think of something. Oh, shoot. What was it? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, it'll come back to me. I think it'll come back to me in a minute. Um, but you're right. It, it is, uh, you have to kind of be on. You really do. Oh, I remember what it is. So a big difference for between you and I is that, uh, big difference between the two of us is that I don't know how long you had to stay inside, Barney. I'm oh. guessing... A long, a, time. Long time. <laughs> a long time a long 20 time 20 minutes maybe maybe more i don't know like hours oh god okay so i didn't have to do that i can't really because i've right. got my arm up holding the puppet and we have our wranglers comes out they come over in between every take if i if if i had my druthers and it's a long take they'll take right. me out of the puppet and so i'll come out and get a little bit of air and go back in but I can't be, you know, the longest I could compare that to would be doing the, the for you, it would be uh, doing the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade because there you're, there's no coming out of the bird. You're sitting right. in the bird in the nest and everybody sees you the whole time and you better be on the whole time because you're going for about an hour or so. And that's hard. That's really right. hard. So I, I feel for you there because I, that is difficult. Yeah, we we were not able to, to get out as, as much. So I built up an... Un, I was in, unbelievable shape because <laughs> Man, you, were, yeah. you were just living in it we we made some adjustments at times but like the the event i talked about with carol that was crazy for me because yeah they would take it off and then you know a minute before we went on he could become big bird but i had mm -hmm. to stay through the whole thing because there was just not yeah. an ability to do that yeah yeah Ugh. That's tough. and and it's <laughs> funny you talk about macy's though because i did that as well a couple times and that's an incredible, absolutely incredible experience because yeah. all the people, I mean, yeah, what's it like for you? Cause I love this. I love this. Cause you're doing the whole parade as well, right? You're doing the whole route before the, oh, yeah. the, the TV appearance. You know, I've tried to explain to people you're, you, you've been out there for hours by the time you get dressed, they get you on the oh, phone yeah. and all that. And then there's a sign, you know, that says you're getting ready into the TV zone. And all of a sudden now you've got to step it up again because you know millions of people don't realize yeah. you've been in, in this costume for hours. Yeah. And now you have to perform for, you know, all yeah, the people on TV. More. Millions yeah. more. Yeah, it's it's a it's insane. I mean, it's again, it's that feeling, that live appearance feeling when you're going down uh, Central Park West, and right. uh, you know, it's it is an unbelievable feeling looking up. And sometimes, you know, I, I'll, I'll do Big Bird one year and then I, I will not do Big Bird the next year. I'll do the count. Just <laughs> right. so I just need a, you know, not to do it every year. And sure. because my enjoyment of it <laughs> lessens over time, but I'll get to do uh, the count. And that's when, again, maybe this is it, Carrie. Maybe it's because, again, inside Big Bird in the nest, isolated. Even though right. I've got Ryan like in front of me with Elmo and, and mm -hmm. Leslie with Abby in front of me, still very isolating. But when I'm inside the float, and I've got the count on and then like Marty Robinson's there with Telly right. and you know, it, it's, it's again, I'm feeling that feeling of, uh, of togetherness and, and uh, you know, inclusiveness. All of us are together kind of having this shared experience rather than me just being this guy inside Big Bird. Right. 
just trying to muscle my way through this time. Uh, but it's an amazing experience. Yeah, that's funny because we'd have Baby Bop and BJ be with us, but we're all in the same boat. So we can't talk. We can't, you know, I mean, we can't really. So, yeah, it's afterwards and, you know, on the on the plane flight back talking about yeah. each other's experience because we can't talk to each each yeah. other. And then also we deal with with weather doing that parade. Oh, yeah. I don't know if yeah. you had one. I've had one in, in the rain. I don't know if you had one. Oh, yeah. but... We've had uh, <laughs> uh, one at least. And and it'll vary. You know, it'll be raining. Uh, we had one year that it was just it was it rained so much that uh, the inside, the paint on the inside of the float, you know, dripped down and was, you know, getting in danger of getting puppets and uh and uh, then we've had years where it's been really warm, like just really warm. And then other years will be just bitterly cold, just <laughs> so cold. You cannot get warm. It's so cold. So it's it's a crazy experience year after year, for sure. Yeah, I, I did one in Minnesota. It was uh, for Target. Barney was the Grand Marshal. And it was negative, some ridiculous amount. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where the where oh. the patrons were actually up in the sky, uh, the sky bridges. Why there was actually no one on the on the street, <laughs> <laughs> the characters, and I have never usually. I'm so warm; it's not a big deal. But they were actually bringing me hand warmers and oh things my for my just for my fingers and toes and all that stuff. Oh man, so, you're not kidding. That's that's a cold parade. <laughs> it was yeah it was it was uh, yeah oh. yeah you get you know but that's. Once again, it's the same thing, right? That the kids are there to see you and they don't know and understand. And yeah. And just, it's amazing to look down at that parade in particular, looking down an avenue and seeing the rows and rows and rows and rows and rows and rows. I mean, just like, I don't know how many dozens deep, 50 deep of people just crowded around. And you can hear them, you know, shouting to you, hey, Big Bird. <laughs> and I don't know if they can hear us because it's so loud. The whole experience is just loud because there's so much cheering the whole way down but we'll yell back to them you know it'll yell something is big bird and uh when we kind of stop and it's a little quieter moment that you can talk back and forth with the with the people on the you know the police officers or the or the you know parade watchers parade goers yes yeah, it's fun. yeah it is it's really cool so i gotta ask you of an experience you had recently where you were a puppeteer and in a body costume <laughs> on the mass right. singer. Yeah. Okay. So that was so much fun. That was a lot of fun. It was, uh, I mean, it was, it was literally one of the most secretive things that I have ever done. Uh, I, I couldn't tell anybody about it. Uh, went out to LA and um, they had built this snail uh, character uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and the snail was very low to the ground. And they had built the snail on top of uh, a wheelchair, like a, a, like a self-motivated -motiv wheelchair. It wasn't the best quality wheelchair because you would push the thing to go and it would kind of, it would go click, click, and it would slowly move forward or whichever way you wanted to go. And then the hat, there was a big hat on this snail and that's where my head was. So. Uh, I got to do the singing part just as me in this wheelchair, okay. uh, moving out on stage and doing the song and trying to do a little bit of choreography. There was a there was some PVC pipe in the head of the snail that I could reach out and grab and I could shake from side to side or move forward if I wanted to, Right. which I did because I had to. I'm a sure. puppeteer. I want to manipulate <laughs> as much as I can. And you don't, there's not a lot of movement in it, but uh, it was beautiful. Uh, character mm -hmm. but then uh kermit was the one who was uh to be revealed and so we had to i said you know we had to talk all this through ahead of time we couldn't just do it oh, in the spur of the moment. we had to talk it through and say like well what happens if you're selected and i said well if i'm selected we have to take the wheelchair out of there and i'm gonna have to sit on the floor because if not i would sit in the wheelchair and i couldn't get my arm Right. I couldn't, I couldn't extend my arm. It just wouldn't, wouldn't work. So they, there were amazing crew and they just, the, during, so what happens is this big secret is what happens is they say it's, oh, snails going home. 
and then they say goodbye to everybody else and then they stop down and then they take snail off or whoever it is and if let's say it's a regular person they take them off they put them in hair and makeup they make them look really good they bring them back on they you know they put the helmet back on they put the hat back on they come back out and right. then they reveal them and they look great <laughs> so right. that's what they're going to do with kermit now so we go off they take the shell off the wheelchair we come out i'm sitting on the floor and you know that's and the rest is you know you can see that on youtube or wherever it's it's uh you know kermit coming out of there uh and it was so much fun i mean they really had no idea i had no idea who anybody else was because it was so secretive it was there were we had like our own team everybody had their own producer team and they only referred to me as snail. Nobody knows who I am, but I had to wear a visor and a hat and a, and a like cloak. I could not <laughs> talk to anybody. Wow. And they moved us back and forth that way. Uh, it was insane, and uh, but a really cool experience. It's a lot of fun. Uh, well, it was brilliant because I shocked like everyone <laughs> that, that yeah. they got Kermit. The first time I think a fictional character <laughs> has been revealed on the mass singer but you know it's kind of fun brilliant. it's brilliant well i want to finish up just asking what it's like for you to go from these different characters because i'm i can't stop thinking about the count now i mean <laughs> to go from big bird to the count there's different levels obviously you have to get up of of energy whether you're in a suit or all of those things what is it like to do you just kind of get into the, to that character do you have to like pull out a big bird and then get your head into to being the count? How does that all go for you? Um, you know, the, the thing that they all have in common, uh, I'm realizing is that they are all energy. There's this energy about them and they all have like, some of them have more, uh, more of a, a roundedness to them and some of them have less. So, the Count, while he is a very rounded character, he's he is an obsessive character. He is obsessed with numbers. He has an obsession with numbers. So, uh, I mean, it's just that energy of putting this obsession with numbers into it. I, I find it now, anyway, fairly easy to go from one to the, if I had to go from one to the other to the next. And, um, and uh, but none of them, well, I will tell you this, it's easier for me, let's say, I have, this is a character that I play called Uncle Deadly, who is this uh, kind of a blue dragony, catfishy looking character. I don't know what he is. He's just this, he's a phantom. He's the phantom of the Muppet Theater. And for some reason, I can just put that puppet on and just talk as the character. Other characters like uh, Kermit, even still, I, I need to have a little bit of guidance, a little bit of written guidance. And so we have a writer named Jim Lewis, who's this veteran Muppet writer, and he has like a joke for everything. And he's fantastic. And so when a certain event comes up, I, I need him to kind of help get me to where I need to be um, with the written word for Kermit and for some <laughs> of the other characters too. But like Uncle Deadly, I generally could just put him on and just go. So it's it's interesting. I can get into those characters fairly quickly and easily. Uh, they are just this energy. What is the energy that is Floyd? What is the right. energy that is Big Bird? What is the energy that Sweetums? You know, they're all just different energy levels and pieces of me, or pieces of that performer that came before me that I identify with, and then I just like. Uh, Jerry Nelson used to say it was like a little piece of him that he would just blow up and make bigger than life. And that's kind of what I, I try to do with these characters. Yeah, Big Bird will, will be close because of Carol, but Sweetums is my absolute favorite. So <laughs> the fact that you do that one, I absolutely love that character. I cannot thank you enough. I have had such a good time <laughs> talking with you and hearing these stories and, and um, it just makes me feel it feels so special to hear someone else that that it kind of has the same experiences you know yeah. you get into this crazy world and you just realize how lucky you are <laughs> to have this experience absolutely yeah i'm I, I every every day that i get to do this i'm i'm grateful for sure 
Well, thank you so much for being on. And I would love to have you back sometime if you would come come back and visit a little bit because I can talk to you for a long time. <laughs> Absolutely. It'd be my, my pleasure. Well, thank you so much for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and your heart open and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week.